In the name of one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of our lives. Amen. <clears throat> Today's gospel text, Jesus starts speaking at the end of a conversation that's already been going on. And it seems that the conversation that they've been having is they were gathered together, Jesus with some folks, and they heard this story, this, that news had just come, that there had been a group of Galileans or people from Galilee who apparently had been worshiping and offering their sacrifices, and Pilate had killed them while they were offering sacrifices so that the blood got mixed in with the sacrifices, right? Um, And as both the the folks who are talking about, they they themselves are Galileans, right? It's very possible that they might have known some of these people who were killed. And I mean, Jesus himself was a Galilean. And as good Jews who... um, you know, part of their worship and their their piety was to offer sacrifices up to God is one of the most holy and sacred things they could do to have Pilate kill them in that act of worship so that their blood got mixed in with their own sacrifices would just be horrendous. It would be offensive. It would be a sign of the kind of brutality that the Roman Empire was capable of. Right, and so they're all sitting around just talking about this thing, and they begin to talk about themselves and say, well, obviously God meant this to happen. What, what did they do that, that God allowed this to happen? Obviously, there must have been something wrong with them because God wasn't pleased with their worship, so they got killed. And in doing this, they're reflecting uh, kind of a, a standard kind of human wisdom that's also actually reflected in, in the book of Deuteronomy, the, the, which is the end of the Torah. In the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy culminates with these blessings and curses. Like if you do the things that are good to do, you will be blessed. If you follow the laws of God, you will be blessed. And if you fail to do these things, you will be cursed. So this is kind of transaction, right? That actually makes a lot of sense in terms of human experience and human wisdom. If you do good things, you know, this is karma. If you do good things, good things will happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you, right? So there's some wisdom to that. Um, and it's born out in human experience. It's the, the culmination of the Torah teaches this. So the, they're sitting there, well, what's wrong with these Galileans? They obviously did something bad because something bad happened to them. And then they're like, oh, remember those guys who died in Jerusalem when that tower fell upon them? What was God punishing them for? So Jesus is sitting around saying this and is like, do you think that's really how it works? Do you think that if you do good, good things are going to happen to you? And if you do bad things, bad things are good, uh, you know, bad things are going to happen to you? Don't you know that good things happen to bad people? And bad things happen to good people. Like that too is also true. <laughs> like there's this deeper wisdom. And so Jesus is like, are you sitting around thinking that somehow bad things happen? I mean, because God is punishing them? I tell you, no, that's actually not how it works. The goodness of God doesn't work that way. The goodness of God isn't transactional. I mean, the goodness of God is actually more phenomenal than that. And, and, then, and then he's like, well, and what are we doing sitting around focusing on other people's and speculating about other people's sinfulness? Don't you know that you need to repent? <laughs> and he says, Jesus says, unless you repent you too are going to experience a similar kind of destruction. That word repent, um, I hated that word as a kid, or I disliked that word as a kid. It felt like that word was, I mean, I'm hearing some laughter, all right. You know, I did have the image of the guy on the street corner, you know, with a sign saying repent. In fact, I think I encountered people in my early youth where you'd find people on street corners saying repent, or, you know, they'd be talking about how bad you are and how bad the world is and how you need to change your life and um you're like okay like do you know me (laughs) who are you like why are you standing who gives you the right to stand on the street corner and yell at me um you know and so and then when i heard the church you know pastors like myself getting up there and talking about repent i mean that it felt like um it didn't feel like it was anything good (laughs) it felt like i was being told no you are bad and you need to feel guilty and if you don't feel guilty, you need to start feeling more guilty. You know, if you feel somewhat guilty, you need to start feeling more guilty than you feel, right? Um, and um, because God is pissed at you. 
and you need to know that God is pissed at you, right? So turn, you know, repent, feel sorry, feel bad. Um, and I was like, oh, um, that, didn't, that didn't feel very helpful, actually. Um, and, it, you know, and it's unfortunate that the, that language, and that's what repentance has come to mean, I think, for many people. Because that's not what repentance is, and it's not what repentance means in the Bible. And so I think it's helpful to sort through confession, contrition, and repentance, which are three separate kinds of things. And we, we tend to conflate them. Confession, contrition, and repentance. So confession is telling the truth. That's fundamentally what it is. It's telling the truth as a way of making things better. It's telling the truth with the goal of making amends for what's happened, for repairing harms that have been done. And and there's something holy and sacred about telling the truth, quite honestly. Contrition is that feeling of feeling bad and feeling sorry. When you actually have done something that's harmed someone, when you actually have done something that, that um, is worth feeling bad about, it's a good thing to feel that feeling of guilt and remorse because that feeling then motivates change. That feeling motivates transformation. And so when that feeling happens naturally and there's a way of expressing that and, 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 and changing the situation and lead, that, that can lead to, to some sort of positive outcome, that's actually a really, that can be a deeply profound spiritual act and feeling to feel contrition. Um, the problem with the preacher, so there's nothing wrong with contrition per se. The problem is the preacher sitting there trying to make you feel guilty <laughs> when maybe you don't feel, you're not feeling contrition, right? And, 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 you know, so that's kind of messed up. Repentance isn't about contrition necessarily. Repentance comes from the Greek word that means metanoia. It means to change your thinking. And it's related to the Hebrew word that means to change your direction. So there's a Greek word that is about changing your thinking that's related to a Hebrew word that's changing your direction to turn around, to actually come back to where you belong. You've you've gotten off track and repent, turn, come back to where you belong. Or your thinking has gotten, your thinking which is now guiding your behavior is off track. Change your thinking so you can come back, right? Um, I'm still obsessing over the war in Ukraine and what's happening there and the tragedy of what's happening there. And, you know, part of that is I feel um, the malevolence, I feel the evil that that Vladimir Putin represents in the world and acts in the world. Um, I was thinking about this in terms of Putin. What would it look like for Putin to confess? And actually, I don't even know if I, we need confession, what it would look like for Putin to just tell the truth. His own people don't understand what he's doing. His own people, the Russian people, have, are, they're, they're being fed falsehoods and lies. And then, you know, because of social media, falsehoods and lies are being perpetuated on the internet. And it creates division. And so is discord. And, you know, then all of a sudden QAnon people are like, oh, really? Well, maybe. Um, I'm just asking the question. Um, And what would it look like for Putin to simply tell the truth? And how actually clarifying and life-giving it would be for him to say, yes, I am raging war against these people because I see them as an extension of myself. And I want to dominate and, and control their country for my own grandeur. Gosh, that kind of truth-telling would help clarify the situation for a lot of people. Right? So there's nothing wrong with truth-telling. And if he was actually saying, gosh, this is what I've been doing, and I now realize I was wrong, that would lead to contrition. I am feeling bad. I realize I made a mistake. I should not have invaded this country I was wrong about who these people were. I thought they wanted to worship me. I thought they wanted to be Russians. Um, And apparently they want their own freedom. 
and they want their own autonomy. And I realize I've made a profound mistake. I'm really, I mean, I don't know what we would do with that. I don't know how we would know how to deal with that. We wouldn't trust it because he's been a liar. So, but it would be profound. We don't need him to feel contrition. We need him to repent. We need him to change his thinking, to change direction and stop doing what he's doing. I use that as an example. That's a huge example. That's a global example that, that I think is really, I mean, it's pertinent and relevant. But what he's doing is only at a global scale because he has as much power what he, as he has. He has the power of the Russian state and the Russian military to be able to do what he's doing, which is why it's re, why it is impacting hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people in Ukraine. But the things he's doing is no different than what humans do all the time. It's just that most humans don't have the kind of power that he has right now in this moment. Humans all the time don't consider the reality of the other person and what their truth may be. Humans all the time don't tell the truth about themselves and their, their actions. Humans all the time fail to love at profound levels. And so the, that, that process of confession, telling the truth, contrition and then repentance is actually really important for us. I've been doing what Jesus told us not to do. I've been focusing on someone else's sin rather than focusing on my own sin and my own need for repentance. And that's part of what Jesus is saying in this gospel text, right? Um, you know, example, so I've, well, what does it look like for me personally to repent? What does it look like for me to change my thinking about something? You know, when I moved up here to Canada from the United States, I was uh, very impressed by the process that Canadian culture and society has gone through in terms of truth and reconciliation. From an American perspective, um, for Canadians to kind of be acknowledging, hey, we have a history with our indigenous people um, that was profoundly oppressive and exploitative and abusive and dysfunctional and we want to tell the truth about that and then we want to work towards reconciliation that's a phenomenal thing like the united states is in no way ready to even begin doing that with its first nations people and so the fact that canadian society is trying to do that however imperfectly it's actually quite astonishing it's an it's a it's a public cultural act of repentance actually because we're trying to change our thinking. We're trying to change our direction and, and turn. Um, I knew that for myself coming up here as an American, there's no way that I could begin talking about reconciliation in Canada unless I had done my own work. I grew up with attitudes and impressions about First Nations that was formed in the United States. So I had to do my work about my thinking before I could even begin to talk to you about reconciliation. So I spent a year learning about First Nations in my country. <laughs> like, I'm from Colorado. I, le I learned that the Utes, actually, the traditional territory of the mountain area, the Rocky Mountains, is the Utes, and the Plains area is the Apaches. I went to the Ute History Museum in Montrose, Colorado, where I began learning about the history and culture of the Ute people. I watched all kinds of PBS documentaries around the history in the United States between First Nations and um, those people, and I did some reading, and so I, I got a sense of the history and began to recognize, oh, my views and attitudes were shaped by the Lone Ranger. I love the Lone Ranger. I get up at 6.30 in the morning to watch the Lone Ranger in black and white, right? Tonto, he was a good Indian, unlike all those bad Indians, right? Or Gunsmoke or whatever Westerns, right? My my perception, my thinking was shaped by things that I didn't even ask. Like, I just absorbed those things growing up. Um, and it was a revelation for me to watch Dances with Wolves. I don't know if anybody remembers that with Kevin Costner back in the day. But all of a sudden, here's a Western, which isn't about, you know, the settlers being the good folks and the Indians being the bad folks. But here's a Western where the settler goes to live with the Indians and he begins to see them as people. And he begins to understand the beauty of their culture. And he begins to understand how 
how uh, horrific the division has been, like that was transformative for me. I'm like, oh. It's an act of how his thinking changed, right? So as people of faith, as people of God, you know, rather, and I know we've, we grow up with this word repentance, and, you know, some of us have this aversion because many people in our tradition haven't dealt with that word very effectively, and they're like, repentance, no, bad, stay away, or, you know, weird guys on street corners yelling at us. Um, and we miss out on the, poss- the opportunity that actually, there's, it's actually a great word. It, it's a word full of potential and opportunity and possibility. Like we should be excited when somebody says, hey, did you know that you can repent? <laughs> we should be like, really? You mean, you mean I don't have to stay stuck? in the way I've been thinking about this? Or you mean I've been doing this thing and I've been on this path and I keep going in this direction um, and, 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 you know, in the, um, there's a cliff and I'm heading off a cliff or I'm, it's creating some sort of destruction, right? And you mean I really don't have to keep doing the same thing over and over again that I can actually change my direction and I can come back to myself? That's possible? And as people of faith, we get to say, yeah, that's possible. You don't have to keep doing the same thing over and over again if it's not leading to flourishing, if it's not leading to love. That you can repent. You can turn, you can change your thinking. And in fact, when you change your thinking and you open your thinking up to the thoughts of God, who says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. Come to me if you're hungry. Come to me if you're thirsty. And I will give you food and I will give you drink. And you don't. You can buy it from me, but I'm not going to charge you. You can buy it from me, but you don't need any money. I'm going to give it to you generously because my desire is to feed you and give you good things. And I can think beyond what you know. Like my thoughts are above. I'm, my thoughts are bigger than, than you can even imagine. So turn, change your thinking. Offer you, let my thoughts influence your thoughts. Let me blow your mind. With goodness, with possibility with hope, with joy. I mean, that's actually what the people of God are all about. That's what it means to, to walk on this, this path. It's to be on a journey that allows us to say, oh, we can step into this mystery that is greater than ourselves and be blessed as a result. Amen.